Okay. We're recording. Hey everyone, thank you for joining. Everybody has been in the waiting room a little bit. Apologies. Um, just hang tight for a second, let folks come through. If there's any need of anybody that has ASL needs, I think for now we're gonna leave options for folks to go ahead and pick the ASL person's video. In the right-hand corner, upper right-hand corner, there should be some options. Select pin video, and then you'll see just theirs. So that way folks can also have share screen and see the facilitators, whoever is speaking as well. Cool. Thank Looks like folks are still coming in. Give folks uh, another minute or two and then we'll get started. Thank you for your patience. Also for closed captioning, there should be a button on the bottom of your screen. You should have an option to turn on closed captioning. Hey folks, let's go ahead and get started. We're at 6.05. Um, and thank you for joining. My name is Paul. I'm with the Youth Justice Coalition. Um, I am the Zoom host for tonight. We'll be taking care of tech, et cetera. So just some uh, housekeeping issues um, and also for our own uh, well-being and creating a safe space for folks. Um, I have turned off folks' video for when they join. Um, I see plenty of folks have turned on your video afterwards. They're able to do that. Um, so in terms of the chat box, um, you will only be able to send messages to folks that are hosts and co-hosts, so you can't share publicly or privately um, just to avoid any nonsense from folks. Um, another item is that I've shut off folks' uh, mics. Well, when they come in, they will be on mute. Um, folks will not be able to unmute themselves. That's just to avoid folks coming in, screaming, et cetera, um, making obscene noises and stuff, which has happened. So um, as we go, um, if there's any questions, please put them into the chat box. Um, some of the facilitators will explain that a little bit later on, how to do that, how to direct them to people to make sure your questions are heard um, and they also get answered in a timely fashion. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to the facilitators. Um, let's have a safe night tonight and have a robust discussion. Could we just mention Real quick, also that it is being recorded in case people do not want to be on screen. Oh, yes. So um, when folks did join, there should have been a little notice that says, hey, you're being, this 
video was being recorded. Um, so just for folks, be aware, it is recorded. Um, if you do not want your face to be in any recording, just to be on the safe side, just shut your video off, keep your camera covered, et cetera. Um, it's just for your own personal preference um, if you have need for that. And also another tool that we will be using is the raise your hand. Um, you should be able to click on participants or participant, et cetera, and there should be an option if you look around for raising your hand. Um, I know some folks may have joined just by phone, and that will be press star nine if you just joined by phone um, to raise your hand. And so what happens is we'll see a blue hand uh, show up next to your name, et cetera, and then we'll, be, we'll know that you have a question or something like that um, if there is need for that as the facilitators um, have need for it. Now, hand it back off. Hey, everybody. Thank you all so much for, for hopping on. Um, so before we um, get started, um, I'm going to do a quick introduction about like what CAT 911 is or um, Community Alternatives to 911. So we are building an autonomous um, space um, in uh, LA County. Um, so a network of teams that you know can operate as community alternatives to police by being the first responders to our communities. Um, and we offer um, skill building um, training sessions um, in the following tracks in peace building, police accountability, domestic violence, and sexual violence, um, mental health crises, um, first aid slash wound care. And all of the work that we uh, do is rooted in the, is rooted in transformative justice because we recognize that there is uh, both an immediate need for safety, um, short term, um, you know, but also long term healing as well. So our goal is to decrease the number of times there is a crisis by one, understanding the root cause of the conflict or harm, um, and number two, recognizing the impact of systemic violence on our communities and the need to dismantle the current systems, and lastly, to uplift the, our desires to heal. And especially given with the pandemic right now, you know, we have, you know, law enforcement is not the, should not be the first responders. Um, and one of the, our values is that, you know, we understand that, you know, there may be a need for people to call law enforcement. And our goal is not to like shame people in time of crisis for their, for calling 911. But, you know, our goal is to be able to provide alternatives so that we can um, have, um, sorry, so that we can provide better alternatives um, to law enforcement. So, um, yeah, it's pretty much a little bit of what we do um, and just really emphasizing that transformative justice is a really important uh, component in developing, uh, you know, alternatives to 911. And to me, this is um, abolition and um, transformative justice in practice because we are not only um, working to dismantle these systems, but we are also trying to build up a new infrastructure, um, a sa safer um, alternative that you know, um, does not, uh, where we don't perpetuate these different harms that have, you know, oppressed our, our communities and harmed our communities. So um, I'll leave it at that and I'll pass it on to uh, the amazing Cap Brooks um, to facilitate the next part of the conversation. So if I can hand it over to you, Cap, super excited that you're on. Give me a second, let me unmute you, Kat. There you go. I was uh, just, just a reminder as well, if folks need ASL, please pin the ASL interpreter's video so you can see it clearer. I was just a talking, so I'll start over again and just say, hey, what's up? Um, thank you, YJC, for having me. I'm really excited about the Northern Southern California connection around this work. My name is Kat Brooks. I'm the co-founder of the exec, um, the co-founder of the Anti-Police Terror Project and the executive director of the Justice Teams Network. And tonight we're going to be talking about um, women and what we need from men to end gender-based violence. And I think the framing of the title of this panel is really important because in a patriarchal society, right, often our voices are invisibilized. And when I say patriarchal society, I mean that by default, men hold the power, men um, are, are who define value, men hold political power, men hold the financial power. Um, 
and women are invisibilized and devalued and demoralized, often seen and utilized as tools or object. And it, it is inside of a patriarchal society um, wherein which gender-based violence becomes something that's acceptable, becomes something not talked about, um, becomes become something that almost from birth, women and those who identify as women, we're taught to just absorb and hold and that it's just part of the world that we live in. And so we always say in movement spaces, right, that those that are closest to the, to the issue um, are the ones that have the solutions to the problem. So that's why I really appreciate the title of the, the, this first panel that we're gonna have tonight. One more thing I wanna say before we you know, get into how this is gonna go <clears throat> is we often use the term in the movement white male patriarchal society, right? And that's because we understand that we live in a white supremacist um, um, nation. That says it's important to understand that patriarchy um, and patriarchal tendencies um, penetrate across race and across class. I, um, I host a radio show and I was doing an interview with someone from Color of Change the other day and we were talking about, uh, but based on their polling, who was and who was not gonna vote for Trump. And what they found is 20% of the black men that they polled were gonna vote for Trump. And the reasons were because he was a businessman, he was a tough guy, he was in control, he had power. And so for me, it was this really interesting intersection of race and patriarchy and, and where we can even lean towards patriarchy when we're actually leaning into our own destruction. Um, so we are going to um, have a panel this evening. We've got some great speakers. Um, part of why I'm excited to have this conversation and I'm glad that this conversation is happening, particularly around alternatives to calling police is because I am both a survivor of sexual assault and a multi-time survivor of uh, interpersonal violence. And um, the story that, that I, I tell that really let me, made it very clear to me in my, gosh, I think I was only 20, um, that law enforcement was not the answer is that I was married at the time. And, um, and my partner, uh, my husband at, at the time beat the crap out of me. And he ended up calling the police. And, and what's important about this is that my partner was, was a white cisgendered male. He called the police after beating the crap out of me. And, and the cops came and I was visibly battered, like visibly battered and him not at all. But guess who went to jail, right? I went to jail. Um, and I remember sitting in the cell that whole night, like trying to, I didn't have the political framework I have now, but trying to deconstruct and really understand what had happened. But, but that night and that 24 hours I spent in that cell bleeding and, and bruised and getting no help whatsoever. And then just let out, right, to go right back into this violent um, household. Um, and then the DA tried to press charges against me. <laughs> um, that stuck with me and, and it was something that ended up shaping my worldview. So tonight our panelists, to the extent that they feel comfortable, are gonna talk about their experiences, have been at home, at work, in the movement, and in the relationships dealing with patriarchy. How has it shown up? How has it impacted them? And what would they want to be different in the future? So we're gonna um, hear from Tahita Shakur, Davon Williams, and Darlene Burke. Um, I'm gonna start with um, Tahita Shakur. Uh, you can introduce yourself and um, open us up, please. Oh, Tawhida, then I'm muted. Huh? Oh, I was just saying. Go ahead, Tawhida. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. It's such a pleasure to Zoom here with y'all. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, so my name is Tawhida Shakur, and I'm really, I'm really happy that we have it, we're having these conversations. Um, because I don't, I don't feel like these conversations are brought up enough. I don't think they're talked about enough and I don't think they're like dissected at all. Even if they are talked about, they're very brushed over. Um, when we think of like gender violence or the harm done to women, we, we think of like, I think when we think of gender violence or harm done to women, we don't really think about it. And we think of gender violence as like, always like someone dying versus like the violence that we experience every day. So like when it's like people harassing us or people like, um, telling us we can't do something because of our gender or just like the unfair treatment. Um, I think that's like when the conversation shifts a lot. So when we think of gender violence, we always think of death as well, or we always say, oh, like, at least it's not bad as this. And when instead we should flip the conversation and say, like, let's not have no type of gender violence. Let's not have any violence, you know? So anyway, thank you so much for allowing me to talk. Um, I, 
Um, can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay. Because I was like, everybody's so quiet. I'm like, can y'all hear me? <laughs> um, so, so the, so basically what I should start off with first is like, when was like the first time I experienced gender violence or like when was the first time like I learned the difference between men and women? Hello? We can hear you, Tahira. Other muted. folks are, other Everybody folks talking. are muted. Mm -hmm. So just continue talking. Okay. Um, so I remember the the first time, and this is a this is a image and a conversation that has been stuck in my head since like forever. So, so since I was five years old, I remember I was sitting in the mosque with my mom, and I had always been told that I had a beautiful voice, and so I was seeing. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but the men in Muslim, in Muslim traditions, the men are the ones that lead women in prayer and lead everyone in prayer. And I thought the men had such beautiful voice. I'm like, mom, why can't I lead prayer? And then my mom told me, girls don't lead prayer. That conversation has never left my mind since I was five years old. That is, I think that is the first time I realized that, that my gender or the, the way people um treat me are going to be different just for that simple fact and then um a story um and then so that kept playing throughout my whole life and so when i was um six and a half years old my dad shot my uncle's friend seven times and so yeah my, my dad shot my uncle's friend seven times am i talking too fast you're fine you're fine okay so my dad shot my uncle's friend seven times and me and my siblings witnessed it. And my parents had just got a divorce because my dad wasn't treating my mom very good. And so soon as soon as the shooting happened, DCFS showed up to the police station and um, blamed my mom for everything. She's like, they were like, you know, um, you, you don't have like, cause I'm, I'm not from California. Like we moved to California when my parents got a divorce. And so we we're sleeping on my grandma's floor because, you know, my mom's Muslim. So like very traditional. So where the man makes some money and the woman stays home and raises the kids. So when they got a divorce, my mom had no money. So we had to come and sleep on my grandma's floor. And so when, when that happened, they took us away from my mom and how women are women are judged on their partner's actions so my dad's action got my mom got got us taken away from my mom even though my mom was not abusing us my mom was a great mom to us and they they didn't believe in her ability to take care of us because she's a woman like we don't believe we don't think women can do anything by themselves um so because because of my mom's gender which i really do believe it's because my mom is a woman they decided to take us away from her, even though there was like no violence done to us um, from her, nothing like that. But it's because we don't believe in women that we got taken away from my mom. And then also like the foster care system, it is a foster, the foster care system is built on white Christian male values. Like it is not intended for people. It is not intended for people of color. So the fact that my mom's black woman and Muslim, Oh no, the foster care system is like, you know, not for her. So that really showed. And then the way that patriarchy showed up in, in, in school where you think most kids are safe was the fact that when I was, when I, when I was in sixth grade, um, a group of boys, um, cause I developed early. So a, a group of boys, um, started bothering me. They started like saying comments about my figure started like touching me and this would go on for six straight months and i had to go eat lunch in the principal's office and i'm in sixth grade and i'm like i'm like why am i being punished i had to have my classes changed even though i developed great relationships with my teachers i loved history i had to train my history teacher it's just because the school was like i don't want the guys to get the wrong idea and then some of them are like you know like the, the boys like you that's why they keep harassing you that's why they won't leave you alone. 
So basically, I was getting blamed for the fact that, um, and, and it's not the boy's fault either, because we are also raised in a world where boys are taught at a young age that they are allowed, they, that they don't have to have boundaries. Um, they're, they're not taught to respect women at a very young age. So I'm not blaming them either. And this, this, the fucked up part is, excuse my language, the fucked up part is that the way that to get them to stop bothering me and stop touching me was one day I knew that they were coming for me, the, the five boys, and I was backing away from them. Um, I, was, I was backing away from them, kind of trying to one, run backwards um, because I saw one of the boys coming towards me. And so he caught up to me, stepped in my shoe. I fell, and it was this pipe next to my classroom. I fell in the pipe. And I and so I fell, and they were kicking me while I was down and, like, ripped open my shirt and touched me. And I had on – and I remember that day because I had on my favorite white shirt that my mom let me – my mom's fav, my mom's white shirt that she let me borrow. And I got up off the ground with, like, blood soaking through my shirt, like, blood on my elbows and my hands like dirt on my face because I had dirt all over my body because they were like kicking me and touching me and I got up and my shoe was broken and I had to and I asked my teacher I'm like I'm like am I bleeding and like I didn't I didn't really notice that there was like blood everywhere and so my teacher was like I think it's just best if you go to the principal's office so I had to walk for maybe 10 minutes to the principal's office with one shoe on like limping looking real crazy in these streets um and I get there and then the school police meets me there and so I go to the ner the school police meet the because we had a school police station on my campus so it's not like the school like it's not like the police had to come and they're already there so they <clears> made <throat> me when I went to the nurse's office and by and keep in mind the fact that they did not contact my parents they did not contact the boys parents they did not give us counseling it was nothing like that these things could have easily been avoided but because my life almost got risk, risked, I don't know, I don't, I'm not saying the ED right, but the effect that my life could have been at bigger risk, that's when they decided to take action. So anyway, I go to the nurse's office, I lift up my shirt, and then I hear flashes, and the, the, the cop is also pulling down my shirt too. She's like, she's like, oh, keep steady so I could take a better angle, keep steady, and then I had to, I had to write a report. Not only am I humiliated, not only am I humiliated because I know I know I look crazy and I just got violated and now it's like the nurses and everybody looking at me with pity, taking pictures of me like I'm an animal without even asking me what I wanted. I didn't know what was going on. I was only 13 years old. They did not contact my mom, they didn't contact anyone. I had to go home and tell my mom what happened. And that's, that's traumatic, that's traumatic within itself. And my thing is, where was the counselors at? One of the boys I later found out, he was suffering abuse himself. And I'm like, we bully when we've been bullied. And that's not an excuse. But also, like, he needed support. Where, like, where was the support at for him? Like, I should not have had to go through that, that really traumatic experience. And then even after the incident, I didn't get counseling. Like, students were like, I'm going to beat you up because you got these guys in trouble. And some of the kids, like some of the, it went on some of their records and then some of them, they are no longer allowed in LAUSD schools. So they're probably at a continuation school. Again, none of this had to happen if we had proper support to begin with, but like, and then me complaining about how they keep um, harassing me and keep bothering me, no one, it, it, it didn't matter until in, until like I could have seriously been injured. Luckily, all the wounds healed, obviously, and things like that. And I'm fine physically, but still, like I had to go two more years in that school where so much trauma has happened. So much trauma has happened to me, and like not even get like support for that because we think again like gender violence only means if you die. If you don't die, you fine. And I'm like, why do we only care about things when it's um when it's the worst thing that happens? I shouldn't have had to go through that. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. we can, so hear, can you. hear you. Um, thank you, um, Tahita, for sharing. Sorry, y'all. 
sorry. <laughs> this is a problem with working at home. <laughs> um, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Um, deeply appreciate it. I wanna remind folks that you can use the chat box to submit your questions <laughs> and comments um, as tonight's discussion progresses. Um, we will be reading them to our panelists uh, a little bit later. I want to turn now to Davon Williams. Um, Davon, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and then um, the, the questions that we're looking at again, or you know, what, is, what have your experiences in the world been with patriarchy? Um, what's its impact been on you? And what would you like to be different in the future? Um, and what do you want from systems, community, and individuals? Okay. Um, well, again, yeah, my name is Davon Williams. Um, my experience with patriarchy, I am a um, gay black male. Um, I've been gay since as young as I can remember. I knew I was different from every other boy um, when I was younger, since I was like seven years old. I just knew I was different. But anyway, there is differences in the LGBTQ community when it comes to patriarchy, male domination, we have those who they consider to be feminine. I am feminine. And then we have ones that are more masculine. And then we have things um, of what they call DL, which stands for down low, men who are not, not exposed or want to stay undercover, as they say, quote unquote. And we are treated differently, definitely. There's, there's a difference between um, how you're treated as a feminine gay male and a masculine gay male. And especially in my personal experience, in general, Black men are seen as to be very dominant and masculine. And I just do not fit that description of the world's expectation of what I am supposed to be to them. I also grew up in the foster care system and pretty much all of my homes I've been to except one when I got to it, um, when I was a teenager, as I got older, I was always the only gay boy there. So I was mistreated in a home sometimes. I would always have to be in fights. I've experienced sexual abuse due to that. When I was younger, um, I, I remember I was placed in a home, I say I was about probably seven or eight years old. My roommate at that point was a teenager. He was 15 or 16 years old and I was being sexually abused by him as, as well during that point and had bad experience um for that and coming to community organizing i the reason i i got into community organizing is because of my experience in incarceration and that's when i found out about the youth justice coalition and i came i joined in and became an organizer there. I am more passionate when it comes to shutting down the mass incarceration system. And there aren't very many organizations or centers or anything as far as support for the LGBTQ community over in the South Central area, if you compare it to Hollywood. And I am not able to get the support I need as to where I'm at. So anybody seeking that support would have to go over to the West side. And there aren't very many spaces for that, but I, I by choice am doing so. Thank you. Thank you, Davon. Um, our next panelist is Darlene Burke with 10 Toes In. Good evening, Darlene. Hi, 
Good evening. Good, hello, everyone. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank YJC for providing this platform to discuss such a very important subject matter. Um, I am going to uh, go through these questions kind of from a domestic violence perspective when it comes to patriarchy. Um, what have been my experiences at home, at work, in the movement, and in relationships dealing with patriarchy? First and foremost, my mom was a victim of domestic violence um, by my stepfather growing up. Um, and oh, I'm sorry, let me also go back a little bit. Um, I'm the founder and executive director for Ten Toes In, which is a mentorship and domestic violence prevention program. We educate, support, and empower couples during and after incarceration. We provide um, support groups for women who are involved with the men who are incarcerated as well as formerly incarcerated. And we also have a mentorship support group um, that we have for our formerly incarcerated brothers. We also go inside of the prisons and we teach the men how to be in healthy relationships. So I wanted to kind of lay that as a foundation. Going back to my experiences, my mom was abused by her husband um, growing up. I witnessed this um, very um, bad situation, but she came out of it um, and became a very strong woman. Um, and dealing with that, looking at the domestic violence, I, you know, I understand that it's about control. You know, he was like the major breadwinner in the household. So he pretty much felt that things should go his way if he's going to contribute the most to the household. So patriarchy at its finest. Um, at work, for me, I do see there's a lot more of the old boys club, you know, because I have my own nonprofit organization. And dealing with funding and things of that nature, you find that you know, men um, who own businesses or nonprofits or what have you, they're typically the ones that are going to, you know, probably be considered first for funding. Um, when it comes to relationships, my personal relationships, as I was also a domestic violence survivor my first year at UCLA um, in my relationship. And it's something that I do talk about um, in our support groups or what have you. And having the organization Ten Toes In and dealing with our brothers who are incarcerated and talking to them about, you know, their domestic violence tendencies or crimes or what have you, it goes back to the patriarchal society in their household where their father was the major breadwinner. He wanted to control the situation if the wife or the mother did not agree with what he wanted done with the children, with the household, or what have you, um, he felt it was okay to put his hands on her and convince her that way. So a lot of the men that I have met in prison, that I have taught in prison, they come from these type of households. And how that um, shows up in their relationships is that they don't value the women um, that they are with because they see them in a different light than what they should. And so for us, what we go in and we do, we teach them how to be in um, healthy, productive relationships. And we teach, we give them the tools um, to rebuild their belief system and their value system so that they can come out of incarceration and be productive citizens and be healthy within themselves as well as within their intimate relationships with their partners. What I want to see from systems, community and individuals is first of all, recognizing that you have a problem of control or domestic violence or what have you and wanting to get help and having organizations like Ten Toes In to provide you with the tools to do that and having a support system. A lot of these individuals, they don't have a support system or they don't want to acknowledge that the problem exists. And when you do, I want to see that we all band together as a community to be able to have the conversations and get to the root problems of why individuals feel that they're better um, because they're a certain gender or, you know, it's okay to um, put their hands on someone because they want to control them or they want things to change in their way instead of having a conversation of coming together as partners and doing it in a more healthy manner. So that's what I have to say about that. Thank you.
Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Um, has everybody else heard that echo? Okay, it's gone. Um, thank you, Darlene. Thank you, Davon. Thank you, Tahuta. Um, we, again, reminder, you can put your questions in the chat box. We're gonna spend the next 20 minutes or so talking um, to our panelists. The first question that I actually do have from the folks that are tuning into the panel is for you, Tahita, um, and it's from Carolina, and Carolina says, what a terrible 13-year-old experience. How did you learn compassion for the boy who harmed you? You are right that the school needed to have a support protocol for such a situation, and have you checked to see if LAUSD has implemented better practices? Damn, that's a really good question. Um, I think that it, I think that I grew compassion for him when I got older and I started, or, I started organizing the year after that. So I started organizing at 14. And so I learned to not look at things as like an interpersonal thing. I look at it as a systematic thing. And so I started learning that if it wasn't him, it would probably be someone else. So it's not his fault. It's, it's, a, it's the adult's fault and it's the school system fault. And also like, I just started thinking about like when my dad got incarcerated, my dad was a boy that started stealing because he needed food. No one cared about him until he committed his worst crime and that was attempted murder. Like just, I started thinking about that. And so if you think about something like that, the only thing you can do is feel sad for someone and you can, you can hope and, and work on creating a better future. So I think that's how I learned compassion, but it wasn't like, it wasn't within that week that it happened. It was like a, a year after that, after I found my own community space and I started organizing. So then I, I saw things in a different way. And so I feel like that's more liberating to think of it that way. Cause I could think of like, oh, pity me, which it's a mess of situation, but like, you have to be a hurt person to hurt someone else as well. So like, you know, I, I think organizing helped me do that. Sorry for the long answer. And then um, I am involved in school work as well a little bit, even though like, you know, I graduated from college, so I'm not like in middle school or high school anymore. So I'm involved in the work a little, but like for years and years and years after that, I did a lot of things around like um, defunding police and also like talking up against um, police and schools. So I did that work as well, but now not as much. Thank you. Um, I want to follow that up and um, Davon and, and, and Darlene, you both can answer this question and I'm sort of riffing off of what um, Tahuta just said around, you know, it wasn't the, the fault of the, 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 um, the boys that attacked her, it was the, it was the fault of the school system. And so just in general, like can, um, Devon, when we start with you, talk about the role of the state in perpetuating um, gender-based violence. Well, I don't think there definitely isn't enough support for it, especially when it comes to the um, LGBTQ community. Um, one thing is, um, that is important to bring up, I believe, is um, becoming sex, becoming a sex worker um, as a gay male. There are many people who are involved in that because they don't have support from their families, um, have very few friends, and even a job, even the work system is judgmental sometimes, and they. The, those are the only things they can turn to. And I've had a few friends um, who've been involved in that. This also brings a reminder to me, have you guys heard of the um, Ed Buck situation? Mm -hmm. But for those who yes. have, Davon, so, for those who haven't, why don't you explain? Huh? I said, I don't know that everybody on, on here has, so why don't you take a minute and explain oh. who Ed Buck is and what he has done and the way law enforcement has responded. Right. Um, Ed Buck was a, um, a man in Hollywood who um, paid for sex workers. And there was a man, um, a black man, um, Jamil. No, actually two. One of, them, one of them's name was Jamil. And he was actually a friend 
um, of, of one of my friends, someone I know. But he, they were both found dead of drug overdoses in Ed Buck's home and in Hollywood. And that's where the um, Justice for Jamil campaign had started. And I've been a supporter of that. And he has not been held accountable for it. Unfor unfortunately, has not been held accountable. And people find themselves trapped in these kind of situations because there is not a lot of support out here especially in areas of where I live in the Los Angeles area, I stay in South Central. Most organizations or community centers or things we need support for are in the Hollywood area. Very few that I know of um, are out in the South Central area. So people are doing what they get, doing what they gotta do and sex work is something unfortunate that um, a lot of the LGBTQ community get into because of all the judgments that is out here. Thank you, Davon. I just I just want to add for people to have context. So Ed Buck is also um, a Democratic Party donor, a big donor. Um, and he's a white man. And the men who overdosed in his home um, are black uh, male sex workers um, and law enforcement on both occasions, um, you know, even though there was drug paraphernalia, drug paraphernalia in sight, like all this other stuff, didn't take him to jail. And if it weren't for um, political commentator Jasmine Kanick down there raising hell in Los Angeles, um, there still would be no charges. He has been indicted, um, but he, he's done no time. Um, so th that's the, Let it be the other way around. Let yeah. <laughs> Let it be the other way around as far as the race concerns. And it bit it had turned out totally different. We all know that. Exactly. And then so again, that's another way we can look at right the intersection of, of patriarchy and white supremacy and, and, and the way that, that that plays out. Um we have um Darlene, uh we've got a, another question, or anybody could could take this. Um We've got a question that says, different organizations that I am in are against restorative justice models when handling internal cases of harassment or conflict because some members believe that it does not center the victim. Do you think using restorative justice is still a good model when it comes to these issues? And anybody can take that. Uh, can you please read that question again for me? Sure. Different organizations I am in are against restorative justice models when handling internal cases of harassment or conflict because some members believe that it does not center the victim. Do you think using restorative justice is still a good model when it comes to these issues? I personally do. I mean, that's what we're doing with restorative justice and 10 toes in. I mean, but it just all depends on how uh, the organization is running it. You know, what I found with 10 toes in and with other organizations, you really have to know um, the needs of your people, look at the bigger picture, and see what's going to best work for those that you're serving. Um, a lot of times, you know, the missions are lost um, because of the money that they're trying to get, because of the, uh, the organizations that they're trying to go under that may change what they wanted in the first place, what the smaller organization wanted in the first place. But if you keep your mission intact and you keep what you wanted to do from the beginning intact, I think that um, it works. That's just my personal opinion. Tahuda or Devon? Tahida, I think I'm saying your name wrong, I'm sorry. I can't see you, so I can't tell if people, okay, so you're not taking yourself off mute, so I'm, I'm guessing that, oh, well, you are off mute. No, you... um, sorry, I just, yeah. I just unmuted. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was trying to take myself. Hi, everybody. I was trying to take myself off mute. Um, you know what? I I love that question, and I do believe in not restorative. I believe in transformative justice because you can't restore something that was never there. Um, for me personally, when that incident happened with those boys, I didn't want police to be called because I I grew up criminalized, but I grew up um, with police. Like you know, my dad was from my dad went to prison. And then like even in foster care homes, like police was heavily involved. 
So for me, the thing that scared me more was having the police involved. And it's because like, and it's because we didn't sit down and have a conversation. Never was I asked, what do you want? What does support look like for you? So for me, mine, even at 13, mine was like, no police, please. Because I've, I've reported older men harassing me to the police and I felt worse than the incident. So police make me feel worse and I didn't want that to happen. So, but also I do believe in supporting the person that got harmed me. So if they want the police, well, that is what they want. I would never push for that. But if that's what they want, then that is what they want. But for me, my wish was not respected, nor was it asked. And I do think we need to start talking about that. I want to riff off that for a second with you, Devon, actually, because one of the conversations that we're having, <laughs> one of the boys working from home life or something else. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> Someone is literally knocking on my door. So you know what? I'm gonna ask. A, a, I'm gonna ask a question from Ellie. I'm gonna ask a question. From, can can someone? I'm sorry, y'all. Can someone take over? Kim. I can. I can um, take over, um, Kat. So there's a question from. Um, this is Ellie. There's actually another question from Ellie um, A. And the question is: um, Is normalizing sex work something discussed in your organizations? especially in context of decriminalization and how does sex work intersect with patriarchy and feminism do you want me to um hand it over to you davon or tahita or darlene does anybody want to take that question i'll go ahead and take it um but yes um sex work is something discussed in our organization and things we look at are what are the resources that these that these people need, what is the reason they are doing it, and what can we as a community or e even government placing funding and fundings in organizations and different programs to have them for housing and job and probably job programs and things, because most people who turn to sex work is usually it's because it's one of just a last resource like they can't find a job they have nowhere to stay um especially when it comes to the lgbtq community there's so much judgment when it comes to work even by our families sometimes i have friends who've been you know have kicked kicked out of their houses when they were um teenagers by their own parents and they weren't getting this getting the, the um, support they they needed. So having to, to turn to these last resources is an issue. So placing more funding from the government into organizations that can help people is something that is very important. Hello? Oh. Thank you, Davon. Um, sorry about that, y'all. Um, Ellie, thank you for stepping in to save the day. Um, y'all, we have about nine minutes left uh, with our panelists, and so this is, would be the time to start putting your questions in the chat box for these amazing beings. Um, Darlene, I, I wanted to ask you um, your thoughts around the intergenerational impact of patriarchal violence. I mean, we talk a lot about how we as Black people carry um, and brown people carry uh, with us inside of our DNAs, generations of trauma. Can you talk about the way you see that play out? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> going inside of the prisons, dealing with our brothers behind the wall, I mean, there's definitely generational um, trauma, uh, violence. I mean, it, it's just the whole, the whole, how can I say, smorgasbord, right? Um, when you grow up, when you grow up, seeing um, certain things in your household, you internalize that, right? And so this is why a lot of our brothers are in custody right now because they did not have the nurturing households that some of us did grow up in. They did not have um, parents who were talking to them about um, having healthy relationships because they didn't see the healthy relationships. And so a lot of them ended up joining gangs um, because that was their surrogate family. So it comes generation after generation after generation because there wasn't a conversation. 
Uh, there wasn't going to a therapist because that's kind of like taboo in the hood. You don't want to do that. And they just kind of got stuck. And when I hold my classes, you know, inside of the prisons and I get to the root causes of why they're actually in prison, um, a lot of times it's because of the household. It's because of seeing their father put their hands on the mother and the mother not really um, fighting back or trying to leave or teaching their children that this is wrong. It's like they stay because he's the breadwinner. They stay because they're obligated. They stay because this is what they were taught um, from generation to generation. So, you know, we really got to start having these conversations, not only in the community, but behind the wall, going inside and talking to the people that society has kind of thrown away because they're coming back home. 95% of people that are in prison, they're coming home. And we have to be ready. We got to be ready with the resources. We have to be ready with the support. And we have to be willing to have those hard conversations with them. Did uh, Tahita or uh, Devon, did either of you want to respond to that? Um, what, I'm sorry, what was the question again? The question was um, the, interracial, the interracial, the intergenerational impact of, of, of patriarchal violence in our communities. Multi-generational, not intergenerational, multi-generational. Hello? Okay. Um, yeah, I think, I, I think that the reason why patriarchy is very hard to deal with is because like, I'm like, for me, for example, I'm like, no one in my family has like ever like dealt, like not dealt with it. So like my mom went through it, my grandma, like, so, but I think it's because like we sit, like racism is so important to so many people, which is very important that like, we don't talk about gender violence or like what, what happens to, to women or feminine people because where like, you know, racism is so prevalent. I, I think that pe I, I think that even for my mom and my family, it's like race is more important than talking about gender and gender violence because gender violence is so normalized. And I think we talk about race a lot that we see a problem with it. Like if racism, ha like if something racist happens, um, then we're like, okay, that's wrong. But if something sexist or something wrong happens to a woman, it's more like, what was she wearing or um or next time like if you don't want to get followed or if you do get followed wear tennis shoes I say this because my mom has told me this before she's like you know in case you have to run away from people instead of simply saying no that is wrong it should not happen at all like you shouldn't have to alter yourself whatsoever but it's because like race is such a race is such a more important topic and it's a topic that's talked about the most that we don't really talk about gender violence. So I see how that like plays out with me and my mom. Sometimes I can't talk to her about stuff because she's like, no big deal. Like at least you didn't die or, or at least this didn't happen. I'm like, it shouldn't happen to begin with. So I, I think like that, those unresolved issues show up a lot. Thank you. We have another question from folks that are tuning in to listen to your brilliance. Um, Oh, you want to go, Devon? Go for it. Um, yeah, I wanted to also bring up in how in LGBTQ relationships, when it comes to pa patriarchy of the masculine one and the feminine one, quote unquote, there could, in some relationships I've had, I've known the friends who've been and in um, sexual abuse and physical abuse. And has I actually had, had a friend who has been raped, did not have a choice as to when, in, in, in saying no when his partner wanted to have sex with him, whether he wanted to or not, he was going to do it. And and he did not really have anyone to talk to. I was one of the people he talked to, but he didn't have any family to talk to and other other people when it came to that. 
And that, that is a, just a major role of, of trauma when it comes to that, especially being a, a black gay male. When it, when it comes to that, we, we are supposed to be more masculine in, in, in that role. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a comment and two more questions. Um, this comment is responding to some connections to LAUSD. It says, the California Healthy Youth Act was adopted in 2016 and mandates lessons for seventh and ninth grade health on discussions on what to do when a person experiences abuse of a, of a, of a variety of kinds, human trafficking, normalizing and explaining LGBTQIA plus identities and more. Many of the things we have wanted to be in the curriculum for a while. Of course, these lessons have to happen more than just for a few weeks in school, and we have to keep fighting for funding to train all teachers in the curriculum. I teach health for LAUSD. Um, does anybody want to respond to that comment? Well, I'll just say that I think that it is um, important to, these kids are growing up so fast these days, and if they don't learn it in a responsible environment, um, they're going to learn it in the streets, and it may be the wrong way to learn. So dealing with, you know, anything sexual, whether it's, you know, having sex with whoever or rape, or they need to learn um, what it is. Because a lot of these kids don't even know what it's like to um, be in responsible relationships and to love and things of that nature. And it really needs to start early, you know, elementary school, junior high school, to really get them to understand the importance of that. Tahira, I'm going to throw this. Does someone else want to go? Tahira, I'm going to throw this next question to you because you were talking about transformative justice and, and a lot of what you said tonight has been about, you know, your journey um, uh, within that arena after what happened to you. So Andrew asks, what do you do when someone who rapes does not want to be held accountable? I do. That is very, that is a very hard question. That is a very hard question. And honestly, I don't know. I think that the person that has had harm done to them should be talked to, to assess their, um, to assess what they want, um, but that that's a very hard question because I, I, I honestly don't know because I, I also want to make sure the person that was harmed is given support, but also like hold, still holding that person accountable. Um, I don't know because if that person goes to prison or jail, like that person that they raped is still going to be raped. Like they're still not going to get offered counseling. They're still not going to get offered resources. Like the system will still make money off of that person's trauma. So like the alternative to transform justice is like locking someone up, but it's like, you still don't get justice. So it's kind of like, I, I, don't, I don't know, like good question, but I, I, I don't know. That's a hard, that's a, big topic. I, I really don't know. It is a big topic. It's something that, you know, we talk about when, uh, in transformative justice circles or even, you know, as we're in the process, like um, YJC is in LA and, and yes. APTP is up here in building alternatives to, to law enforcement and police and prisons. Like these are the kinds of things that we're going to have to tackle. The co-founder of, of APTP, Terha Ak, talks about primary predator and secondary predators. And, you know, the primary predator being um, you know, white supremacy and all of the evils that go along with it that ultimately create the secondary predator, but that doesn't mean that we don't have to find a way to hold the secondary predator accountable. Um, so these are, these are ongoing conversations as we continue to try to build the world that we're all fighting for. Um, okay, a couple more questions, and then someone should hit me when there's a hard stop. I think hard stop was 710, I think, is what I was emailed. Um, so I want to go to this question from McKean. Um, McKean says, how do I, as a cis man, best fight against patriarchal violence in my community, especially in organizing spaces? Who wants to take that? Who 
want to organize. What do you want from Manning Organizing Spaces? Well, I would say respect. Well, <laughs> for me, I would say, this is Damon, for me, I would say respect in general, just as being a gay male, um, there's judgment most of the time, usually in general, there's judgment. Just having just the primary respect as every person deserves is, is just something plain and simple. Plain and simple. Can I have the same respect that you, that you were getting? Tahita or Darlene, any of you want to respond to that question? <laughs> I tried to mute myself. Um, I, so basically the question is like, what can someone do um, that wouldn't necessarily experience gender violence? Like what can they do to show up for others? Well, specifically, I mean, I think this is about allyship and, um, uh -huh. You know how 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 can assist assist man, um, you know best fight against patriarchal violence. How can it be a principled ally, um, especially in organizing spaces, which to me is a, is the interesting piece of the conversation because because that's the place we get sedity in a movement and try to pretend like we ain't got it. Oh yes, yes. Uh -uh. Like, do you hear these mm -hmm. snaps? I'm snapping for you because that that is so real. Um, first off, um, always always try to check yourself and check those around you. So don't think of what makes you comfortable. Think about what makes the person you're trying to be an ally for with makes what makes them comfortable. So a lot of times like people don't speak up and the person that is being harmed shouldn't have to speak up. It should be the person that's not being harmed or don't face those type of oppressions that should be speaking up. Um, so if you're, cis, if you're cisgendered and you're a man, um, it is very likely that you're not going to experience um, gender violence. So, like, what you can do is speak up, one. Two, educate yourself. Three is also bring people along with you in this, in, in your journey, because that's also very important. I think, organize, I think organizations also need to highlight women more. Um, I think movement spaces need to highlight women more. For example, I go to a lot of actions, and it's a lot of men speaking at actions. Um, when we think of Black History Month, we think of men, we think of Martin Luther King, we think of Malcolm X, amazing people, but like, what about the Ella Bakers? Like, we have to, I, I think, I think we have to bring, a, I think we have to educate ourselves on the history of how women have held things down, and femme people have held things down as well, um, because they've, like, they've been erased so long that sometimes it's hard to bring them up now, so I think it's, a, I think, as organizers and people that organize, it is your job to um, bring women, like it's your job to uplift women um, because if your space doesn't, most spaces won't. So it's, I, I think that is to ask, like uplift women. Um, also like challenge, challenge yourself. Um, if you know you have ideals that are like detrimental to women, challenge yourself. I think you should also ask questions, even if they make you feel awkward. Um, I think you should always be open to learn and also like, and then sometimes people don't want help. Sometimes people want to help themselves and they want to be left alone. So I think that respecting all of that, if I'm making sense, I think all of that is very important. But most importantly, make sure that other orgs are, make sure orgs are challenging sexism because we, a lot of times, like we, like say, for example, if we're dealing with the jail fight, we don't really talk about gender violence. And then when people are, that are from incarcerated get out, then it's like, we have more, sometimes more violence to deal with. You know what I mean? So I think, I think we let gender or like the harm done to them people um, slip out of our fingers. Um, there's Go ahead, David. Um, yeah, one thing I wanted to bring up when it came to this topic. Um, also, I have I find that I I often have to check myself um, sometimes when it comes to organizing with my peers in the LGBTQ community because just being 
a gay male in general experienced a lot of judgment, but I got my sisters and my other um, brothers there too, who are transgender and they go through even far worse than what I go through. And we have to be supportive of them. We have to be supportive of them because they, they are just going through even way worse judgment than me as a gay black male. It, um, going through, they experience even worse judgment. So I, I came to find that partnering with my transgender peers has, has, is something very important. We must not leave them out the movement. That's all I had to say when it came to that. Oh. That's right. I was just having this conversation um, around even, you know, in the police violence movement, like where, where are we falling down on not uplifting um, particularly black trans women and their experience with law enforcement um, and incarceration. Uh, so to my earlier point, you know, we got work in the movement to do too. Um, I, I, we've got like 90 seconds. And so I just want to say, does anybody have a burning desire to say one last thing before we thank you profusely and wrap this panel up and move on to the second panel? Um, I just want to say, this is Darlene, to be comfortable in your own skin, teach people how to treat you, and don't be afraid to tell your story. Wonderful. Tahita or De Devon, any like last 30 second words of wisdom for the people? Okay. Oh, oh yeah. Can't hear her. We can't hear you. We can see you now though. On mute. You on mute, Tahita. Hey, now I'm unmuted. Um, I was going to say that my last comment would be, please join the fight. Please be conscious. Um, and, if, and if you don't know how to do that, um, go to an org that has, the, that has the capacity to teach you and to help you grow. Um, yeah, because the movement needs everybody. And the movement needs everybody. And it's your job to go out there and it's your job to unlearn what you've been taught and learn something new. If you can learn something, that means you can also unlearn it and challenge yourself and ask questions. Be awkward, go ask questions because you sitting there being silent or wondering things is only, you're only gonna harm others to continue to harm others and also harm yourself. So, you know, you got this. Awesome. Devon? Um, nothing um, in, important to say at the moment right now, but I'm glad to be here having this conversation and we just need to just spread the word out, get, get everybody in knowledge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tahita Shakur, Cage Free Cannabis, Davon Williams, Youth Justice Coalition, and Darling Burke, 10 toes in. I'm sure if we were in person, people would be applauding loudly. It's been a pleasure to talk to y'all. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Good evening, everyone. This is Mark Philpart with Policy Link and the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color. Um, thank you to all of the previous panelists. Uh, facilitator Kat Brooks is a hard act to follow. Uh, Kat is a professional radio journalist. Uh, and so, you know, you can expect uh, much less polish from me. Uh, I am uh, pleased to be on this panel, uh, pleased to uh, be able to facilitate this conversation. Uh, I work with PolicyLink and PolicyLink supports the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color, which is a national network of leaders who are focused on transforming systems that are failing boys and men of color, their families and communities. And for us, this particular conversation has been at the forefront of our work 
um, just last year, uh, we culminated uh, a body of work that really uh, began this effort that we launched called Healing Together. Um, you know, we had been for several years prior to the launch of the campaign, thinking about the way in which we could approach this question of gender-based violence um, as a group that had had a focus on boys and men of color and, and really looking at uh, race and gender justice, it was important for us to not only think about the ways in which uh, boys and men of color were uh, victimized in the sense that, you know, we looked at life expectancy issues and we saw that, you know, for black and Latino boys and men of color, um, more broadly, homicide was the number one and number two cause of death. And we wanted to look into that, but we also wanted to understand more broadly and get deeper into um, how violence was emanating, um, both in terms of how people were coming to violent behavior and the role in which uh, violence was kind of uh, playing in the home and how we could uh, in partnership with some of our community organizations that participate in the network, like the Youth Justice Coalition, like Anti-Police Terror Project, and, and many, many others, uh, begin to explore this question of, you know, what we can do around uh, gender, ending gender-based violence, ending intimate partner violence. Um, and for us, that exploration really came because we were looking at gun violence and as we got further into that, we, we saw that there was a need to look at violence in the home um, because the violence that was happening in the home was then being replicated in the community and in the streets. And so um, we see it as a through line that uh, is really deeply connected. And our theory of change um, you know, is really about trying to engage uh, men in conversations that uh, are focused on ending violence um, and ending intimate partner violence is the center of our campaign, uh, Healing Together, uh, which 70 organizations signed on to last year when we launched it in October. And for us, that body of work has really um, been a great space to learn uh, and grow and be in partnership with uh, a whole host of folks who uh, we honestly didn't expect to be engaged with in that deep of a way, but it, it really is a, uh, a reflection of uh, transformative solidarity that uh, we are able to work so closely with folks uh, uh, in this endeavor, which is focused on shifting away from punishment um, and really finding ways to heal and ensure safety uh, for everyone uh, so that we can prevent and end violence. Um, one of our key partners is the California Partnership to End Domestic Violence, which is a network of domestic violence service providers throughout the state of California. And um, their insight and leadership has been tremendous. Um, they have uh, fully taken this work up in ways that allow for them to uh, be a deep partner and to learn from the community organizations in, in our network like YJC and Anti-Police Terror Project and Courage and Fathers and Families, um, many of the organizations that are, are working on these issues and wrestling with ways that we may, we might be able to shift away from our current uh, response to domestic violence uh, because we recognize that the current response isn't helping anyone. Um, the more we rely on violence um, to end violence, the more violence will fester and so uh, we see police involvement as, um, you know, part of the problem. And oftentimes it is the uh, reason why people have become violent in many instances, um, you know, and, or, or, or the reason why violence continues to, to fester. Um, and so we have tried to resort to alternative means for safety. Um, and this uh, conversation is, I think, one of the ones we're really excited about because uh, we greatly admire YJC's leadership in this space and 
the way in which they've been cultivating uh, this community uh, and trying to dig deep in terms of finding alternative approaches to uh, 911. So um, one of the things that um, I'm going to do is uh, talk a little bit about uh, the, the panelists and then have them introduce themselves. Um, for folks who, who don't know, um, CAT 911 is a, um, uh, 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 an effort that has, um, uh, has been a leader in this space. Um, you know, community alternatives to 911 uh, is, is really a, a focal point for many of us um, who are looking for models throughout the state um, that focus on uh, how we might rely on uh, community-centered approaches to safety. Um, as uh, clear as that may be to many of you who are on this call, um, it is not widely comprehended that community organizations can play a role. And so we have been uh, trying to elevate that narrative and that frame and really trying to shine a light on uh, CAT 911 and YJC, as well as uh, Anti-Police Terror Project and their work around Mental Health First in Sacramento. Um, but you know, we need to grow these models so that there are uh, more uh, investments in community-based approaches to safety. Uh, and we see now that there's a greater demand for that, mm -hmm. and we hope to be a partner in uh, helping to lay that foundation with CAT 911 and others who are at the forefront of this work. Um, we have a great panel lined up today. Uh, David Turner with the Brother Sun Selves Coalition uh, is joining us, and Johnny Rodriguez from Kamai Girls in Action in Long Beach are both uh, phenomenal leaders who have been part of um, Brother Sun Selves Coalition. Uh, which is also a part of the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color. Brothers Sun Selves Coalition is kind of like the Los Angeles County um, uh, uh, component of the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color. So like the LA chapter, if you will, of the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color. And both have um, a, an incredible track record in this space, are very credible and well-respected leaders in their communities, um, have very power, powerful personal stories, and um, I look forward to uh, sharing them in just a second or having them share them in just a second. And I wanna say that for many of us um, who are a part of this network, um, deep reflection and study and listening has been key to being on this journey, um, to thinking about uh, how we can uh, decenter patriarchy, how we can um, combat gender-based violence. Um, and I, speaking for myself, you know, I, I would just say that, you know, I'm not perfect. I don't have it all down. Um, and I just continue to be in a reflective stance, um, continuing to try and learn and grow. Um, but the reason why I got into this work in the first place was because of my own experiences with gender-based violence and the experiences of my family members, um, you know, growing up, uh, I'd always heard that, you know, my mom's uh, mother was taken too soon. And, you know, when I got to an age where my mom felt comfortable sharing with me, um, she told me that her mother was killed when she was eight, uh, waiting in an employment line in downtown Los Angeles. Um, and for her, that, uh, impacted her life in a way that I hadn't really come to grips with um, until she shared with me. Um, and then everything else started to make sense, you know, why she was in an abusive relationship, how um, abuse and other uh, forms of gender-based violence uh, have manifested in my family, um, and how I was even, um, you know, kind of a product of all of that. And, and, and my own behavior. And so um, I think that, you know, we all have uh, experiences um, that we bear that, you know, kind of bring us to this space in a way that, you know, have shaped our understanding and 
I think it's in that vulnerability and understanding um, those things that we kind of can begin to uh, make inroads towards, you know, changing our culture, changing our, our practices, changing the way we show up and how we talk to one another and how we love and appreciate one another. And so that's the spirit I'm coming to this conversation with. And with that, um, I'm excited to have my brother, David Turner, uh, take the mic and say a little bit about himself uh, so that we can then hear from Johnny and get into a discussion. Cool. Um, what's going on, folks? Uh, again, David Turner from the Brothers and Sales Coalition, um, also connected to uh, Black Lives Matter Los Angeles and the movement for Black Lives. Um, so, Mark, just a quick question. Um, so we're going to start off responding to the questions that are on the slide. Or do we just do we just go for it? Hello? Oh well, let me talk. You're muted. You mute yourself back. Oh, hey, Paul, what happened? Hey, hey, David, Paul won't let me talk, man. Look, <laughs> just go for it. <laughs> hey, okay. Um, so yeah, so I, I was making sure I was, you know, taking notes that way I could, you know, hit certain points. Um, but yeah, man, um, you know, I think uh, to start, you know, um, I grew up in a situation I think that is um, that is not atypical, but is also like different. Um, so my mother, um, was a domestic violence survivor, um, but not directly from my dad. Um, my mother was in a marriage prior to, um, prior to meeting my dad and, um, and she was married to a cop and this cop would, you know, beat the shit out of her. Right. And essentially there was nothing that she could do. Um, and she internalized a lot of that trauma. So, um, so, you know, one of the things that, um, when she got divorced from him, um, you know, she ended up having to pull a gun out on him. Right. Um, and, you know, like she had to essentially match, his level of violence in order to be, in order to leave, right? Um, so that not only fostered a greater distrust in police, but it also, um, but it also, I think, you know, changed my mom, right? You know, because she was, um, from what I know, right, uh, my mother passed back in 2007, but, um, but, you know, from what I know, based on accounts of what I've heard from her before, um before she met my dad and just you know in her youth right she was a really nice and outgoing person right but that relationship changed her so um as she met my dad right like what she learned from her past relationships was that you know violence is what got things done so um so you know my dad being um you know formerly incarcerated um, being a man who, you know, had a uh, felony, right, um, she would oftentimes, right, like, they would get into arguments and things would escalate to a violent situation. Um, and, you know, whether um, he was the aggressor or she was the aggressor, you know, things would get hostile, right? Um, things would get hostile. And that was sort of the environment that uh, my sister and I grew up in, right? In addition to that, you know, of course, they were, you know, violent towards us because that's all they knew, right? Um, so I think with the uh, first question, right, you know, was how have you experienced patriarchy in your life, right? Like, I think it shows up, right, by one, not only the will to be violent, but also the will to dominate. And oftentimes, right, like this, um like a particular body can then enact that will you know on on somebody um and watching this happen you know whether it was um you know whether it was you know like my dad calling my mom about her name or um my 
you know, my dad, um, like, physically harming uh, one of my cousins who had came out as gay, right? Like, that um, that was a part of my experience growing up, right? Um, and again, definitely teaches you, right, that violence is supposed to be the way. I think for me, um, when I began to start to address this and when I began to unmake it, right, or start, start the process of unlearning, because you're always still unlearning, right, is um, in undergrad, I went to Cal State Dominguez Hills um, for undergrad. Um, my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, um, Jamel, some of y'all know her, um, we took a class together. It was Womanhood and Gender in Africana Studies uh, by a professor named Jalandra Davis. And in that class, um, I not only began to um, I not only began to like read, you know, black feminist literature and understand, I think, intersectionality more deeply, but I also, um, I also had to come to terms with a lot of my own internalized behaviors and practices, right? Like, you know, why was it cool, you know, for me to, you know, sing little Wayne, Lil Wayne songs and say no homo, right? Like, you know, why, you know, like, like why? right is the like why was the b word a part of my vocabulary you know um so really had to wrestle with a lot of that right um and had to like also sit there as the only masculine identified person in the class and hear women not only discuss the readings but also talk about their own experiences with men and how i became a reflection of that right so um, as much as it was instructive, it was also an accountability circle, right, um, you know, for an entire semester. And I had to take that class with my partner, right, who would be looking and be like, mm-hmm, you know? Um, so, yeah, so that definitely changed me, right? Um, it changed me and I think changed how not only I thought about the world, but also what I need to be doing as a man to um, to show up and to um, to show up and to do right, right, and to do um, to do gender justice, right, and do it as, as an ally. Um, you know, so I had already been interested in doing work for and with boys and young men of color, right. So I made it my mission that if I'm going to be doing that work right not only on the racial justice side or like educational access side but also you know i want to make sure that i'm developing allies right you know and i've been doing i've been engaged in this work right i think professionally since 2012 um but really since 2010 right you know being engaged in boys and men of color stuff and i think on a very tangible note right like some of the things that um that i've been working on and i think we need to do more of right first is building curriculum right so you know what does it look like to teach uh boys and young men about patriarchy about intersectionality about um about violence right um and how do you decenter right like how do you decenter men in that in a conversation that's exclusively with men and young boys. Um, so an example, right, is um, in uh, while I was working at the uh, the Social Justice Learning Institute, we had developed a lesson um, that focused on um, that focused on police violence, but police violence against Black women, right? So we talked about, you know, the Daniel Holtzclaw case. Um, Daniel Holtzclaw was um, a biracial man, Asian and white, who was um, charged with, um, who was charged with, and I think he was sentenced to 250 years uh, in a prison time for intentionally raping um, black women, right? Because, um, you know, because essentially he said nobody would believe him. So I'm going to assault them. So we look at that particular case and we look at the case of Kayla Moore, right? A black trans woman who was killed by law enforcement in, um, in Berkeley, right? And the students really began to understand intersectionality because it's not like it's race, it's gender, 
you know, it's sexuality, it's all of these things working simultaneously. And, you know, I think one of the prime examples of that is when, you know, one of my, uh, one of my students who, you know, was, uh, um, was a gang member said, oh, yeah, so it's like being dropped off in the rival hood. And not only dropped off in the rival hood, and you got the wrong colors on, and your phone is dead, and you don't got the burner on you, right? Like, so essentially, right, like, he was using his own world to then make sense of, okay, so what does intersectionality look like, and then how does that show up? So, um, so definitely using lessons like that, I think, to really draw that stuff out so that way, uh, you know, young brands can really begin to understand why these things are issues. Um, I think next, right, is also making sure that we hold um, not only young people, but also other persons accountable, you know? So when you see some shit, address it, right? Uh, when somebody says something, right, like you you nip it in the bud right then and there, right? So, for example, if somebody says, you know, oh, oh, that shit's gay. Wait, no, time out. Stop. We're going to address this right now. What do you mean by that? We know. Um, or if you happen to be walking by and, you know, somebody is catcalling, um, some, uh, some femme identified person on the street, right? Like you stop it immediately, right? Like, okay, time out. Whoa. How do you know that's what she wanted you to even say? Right. What are you talking about? Right. Like you don't even know this girl. Why are you doing that to her? You know? So I think, um, as, uh, as an ally, right? Like, not only doing those work, not only doing the work to teach boys and young men, but also too, right, just in my day-to-day -day life, making sure that I address those situations and address them as they're happening, I think is critical. Because um, otherwise, right, you're gonna miss out. So, um, so yeah, I think um, especially, right, like if I wanna be committed to the liberation of, you know, all oppressed peoples, um, I think uh, black folks, right, specifically, right, you know, I have to be committed to all black lives, right? Like that includes, you know, black trans folks, black queer folks, black women, you know, that includes formerly incarcerated folks, right? That includes, right, like the folks who are on the margin, right? So, um, so with that being said, you know, it's definitely important, I think, to uplift those things. And it's also important to make sure that we're doing the work not only to unlearn these behaviors, but also to address the trauma, right? Address the trauma that people have experienced because they learn that violence from somewhere. And you can learn those behaviors, you can unlearn them as well. So I'll pass it off to, uh, to Brother Mark. Thank you, David. I uh, appreciate you, man. We'll come back to you um, as we uh, get to the Q&A portion. Uh, Johnny, uh, if you're on, I'd love to turn to you to share a little bit about who you are and your experience and how you've come to this work. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Johnny. Uh, he, him, his are my pronouns. I'm a cisgender male, queer, two-spirit person. Um, I want to actually take a moment to acknowledge the folks from the first panel. Um, as they were sharing, uh, I really felt uh, a lot of hurt in my heart that people are experiencing this, um, these kind of harms from, from men. Um, and I, especially someone who's been committed to uh, teaching men to do better for a long time, it, it still hurts me to know that this is happening, um, which is a large part of why, um, why I engage in this work. A little bit about how I ended up here. Um, I grew up in Fresno in the in the late 90s. If you all know anything about that place in that time period, there was a lot of uh, gang violence. Um, this is also the time that, actually, let me take a st couple steps back. Uh, in, my, in my family, uh, the women run the show, like no doubt. The women are, are the ones that make decisions for our families, um, who like, we follow their lead. Uh, but even in that, there's a way that the women in my family, uh, unintentionally, at least not, I, I believe it was unintentional, um, upheld patriarchy. So there's a story that my mom tells me about um, my dad wanting to change my, my diaper like when I was a baby. Um, and then my auntie's coming in the room and trying to push him out. Like, that's not your job. You're not supposed to do that. Let us do it. And uh, my dad got really angry and was like, this is my child. If I want to change his diaper, I'm going to change his diaper. 
Um, and I think that was like a powerful story for me to hear. Cause even in, in, uh, in like my growing up, uh, you know, I wasn't allowed in the kitchen. They got all these great recipes that they won't give to me cause I'm a boy. Uh, just different, like those small, like ways of, of like being that I was always told you can't do that because you're a boy or you shouldn't do that. That's for the women to do. Um, and those are the examples that I saw. Um, but I was also really aware of like how it made me feel like, um, there was like a disconnection. Like I want to cook, I want to clean, I want to do these things, um, but I can't do it because of my gender. That doesn't make any sense. Um, and then on the on the like other side of it, you know, going through the community and experiencing a lot of interpersonal violence because I was openly queer. Um, and people always like uh, testing my manhood or seeing how tough I was. Like I, I, you know, there was a lot of times where I couldn't go to certain places because I was afraid that I was gonna get in a fight or I was gonna get jumped and all of these things because I was, I chose to be an openly queer man. Um, I think being aware of all of those, all of those nuances is what led me to like, uh, to think about these things more critically. Um, and then, so I was really aware and I really reflected on these experiences and how it made me feel. And I started to think about like, how do I wanna be, how do I wanna show up as a man um, in this world where all of these things are happening, um, which led me to eventually uh, lead a program where we were talking to men of color about about sexism, patriarchy, but also about race um, and racism in the LGBTQ community. I'm in classism, we were breaking down all of these things. Um, I did that in the Bay Area for many years, um, which led me to the work that I'm doing now uh, with Kamai Girls in Action. Uh, I moved to Long Beach in uh, 2012 and that was uh, around the, the beginning parts of the BC initiative and the Boys and Men of Cup, the Sons and Brothers initiative through the California Endowment. Um, and I, I came to help Kamai Girls in Action build out the Young Men's Empowerment Program. Um, and so it was very similar to the work that I was doing in the Bay Area, but it was instead of the LGBT community, it was uh, young men of color, high school boys of color. And so for the last uh, since 2012, I've been teaching young men, uh, mentoring them, talking to them about um, patriarchy and, and you know a lot of other things. But I think I really learned a lot in those spaces and talking to them um, and learning for myself to be the person that I needed when I was their age. Um, and that's sort of the like the spirit that I come with is like, what was it that I needed at that time in my life that I wasn't getting? That you know, that's the question I always ask. Um, and for me, it's a lot about. Uh, mentorship, uh, someone to like talk me through things. Um, I think a lot of times as young men, uh, we're not allowed access to our to our emotions and our feelings and our inner world. Um, and I think for me, uh, as you know, throughout the years, the large percentage of the young men that I've worked with have been straight cisgender male. Um, and I feel like because I am exploring these things, I'm able to to explore them with the young men about how, like this, how do we access our feelings if it's uncomfortable, or how do you show platonic affection to the, to the men in your circle um, and things like that. Um, so I think through that, I've been able to kind of develop, um, one, my own personal analysis and understanding of what it is that we need to teach our young men so that they can be uh, better young men and so they can do the work that they need to do so that, uh, you know, I'm always thinking about the next generation. So it's always like, what do we teach these young men so that they can teach the next group of young men and this, you know, we can kind of like, blossom in that way um, and you know I, I, a lot of I go with a lot of what David was saying around the curriculum uh, I spent a lot of time writing curriculum for uh, KGA or like helping build out their curriculum my uh, grad thesis was a curriculum you know it's just really like the, the way of learning the way of teaching um, but also it's it's the relationship that you have with the at least in you know in, in the place that I sit working with young men is the relationship that I have with them so that they can actually feel comfortable asking me questions that they, they don't have someone else to ask, right? Um, one of the things that really stood out to me when we were talking about this panel today was a, a, a conversation we had, maybe it was last summer or the summer before that, where we actually had um, straight cis young men and queer and trans young men sit and like talk and ask each other questions that normally wouldn't have happened in like another space. Um, and I remember when the questions were coming out, I got a little nervous, was like, oh, have we done enough of the prep work in this like container that the young men are gonna feel safe to have these conversations? And it was really beautiful. They were asking 
very typical questions the queer and trans young men were answering them and like kind of reflecting with each other i mean in all of my years i don't think i'd ever been able to see a space that was that powerful i mean that the queer and trans young men were able to express how they felt and how they were feeling and like their perspective and the cis straight men were able to hear you know that perspective that they may not have been able to hear in another place um, um I think that's it. I mean, I think I, think I have a lot I have a lot to say. It's a, it's a lot on my mind. I think there's a lot of uh, a different ways that this can go. But I just want to say that in our work, um, for those of us who are working with young men, it's, it's, it's a combination of modeling what healthy masculinity uh, looks like and also uh, from a place of love, challenging the young men and the other men around us to uh, do that internal work that they need to do to sort out, like, why do they... Why do they act out in this way? Um, and it's not easy. It's hard work, and we have a a long way to go. But I, every day, I'm learning from the young men as, as well as I'm, I'm teaching them. I think I'll end there. Thank you, Johnny. Um, really appreciate that and uh to thank you to you as well david one of the things that really resonated with me as i think about the previous panel um was this question of safety right and just how much uh we lack it in our communities and then when i heard david talking uh a little bit about some of the um you know, young men he was working with and just examples of how to, how to uh, check people when um, problematic behavior arises. And just, you know, and from my perspective, thinking about how I was raised and what I kind of came up with, this notion of safety and the way in which um, I portrayed what I thought was masculinity and what I thought was healthy um you know was really a caricature and was really um you know uh me pretending to be something i thought i had to be in order to fit in right in order to fit into this societal definition of what masculinity is and you know i wonder if y'all can react to that just a bit and whether you know you have thoughts about that i really um am am grateful for your leadership and it's so uh, amazing to see leaders like you having conversations with young people um i couldn't imagine being in those kinds of conversations when i was coming up and so uh grateful for the work you do but i, I wonder if you have any reactions to kind of that that question of safety and how people um, uh, may be uh, uh, trying to fit a mold in order to get by um, in, in terms of, you know, societal norms. And, and how do you challenge that? I don't know how to unmute either of you, but I, I think um, Paul can help with that. I was, I was struggling to unmute myself. Yeah, <laughs> you, you yeah wanna... I, same here. You yeah. want to go first, Danny? Um, I mean, I think I think I just want to say, like, you know, if we're talking about safety, um, the the patriarchy is colonial, so we have been experiencing uh, patriarchy for a, a long time, and uh, you know, safety is really important. We want to get our folks as safely as safe as we can, as soon as we can, but it it really is the uh, relationship building and modeling the healthy masculinity. Um, that's like the, the, I think the way that's gonna be longest lasting. I'm sure there's like some short-term interventions that, um, that we can look at and explore, but really, you know, we're talking about the types of men that the men in our community are looking up to. We have to create enough of the like positive side of those, you know, I don't wanna like, I don't wanna start painting a picture that all men are are toxic or all of masculinity is toxic, but what can you do to increase healthy masculinity and positive masculinity so that there are just as many men like us who are trying to do right uh, 
more of us actually than there are of like the negative uh, things, the stereotypes, the violence, the uh, objectification of feminine, you know, all of those things. We have to really work to to build up the the the, uh, the positive masculine. Yeah. Um... I, I I would definitely um I would definitely uh agree with that. Um I think one thing too, right, that I definitely wanna uh I definitely wanna underscore, right, is that um I know for me, right, like growing up in the in the bottoms of Inglewood, California, you know, just all along the, the Crenshaw area, like one of the things that you're kinda taught, you know, is that um and, and, and this isn't like an explicit you know, like people sit down and teach you this, but it's something you learn to survive is that, you know, violence is what keeps you safe. And I think that is something that we have to unlearn, right? Like, you know, I was I was taught that like when I got to a new school, you know, I transferred schools a lot, that I had to beat somebody up in my first few weeks so that way people would know not to press me. Right. Um, you know, I was like, like, I was, I was taught that like, yo, like if somebody hits me, I need to hit them back. Right. So that way I show them, um, you know, that I'm not to be messed with. Right. Like, and, you know, I, I think like the way how we think about violence, right. The way how we think about harm and harming other people, you know, I think is deeply rooted, not only in, um, in patriarchy, but is also deeply rooted, I think, to what um, Johnny mentioned in colonialism, right? Like, you know, because again, our lands were colonized, we were violently stolen, you know, and and that's the world we exist in today. So I think for sure, right, like addressing that part. Um, and I think to your point, Mark, about like safety, right? Like, and and what does it and what does it look like to you know, try to help communities be safe. I think the points that I were talking that I was talking about, you know, um, with like stepping in, like, you know, to sort of see something, say something thing, um, that helps. But, um, but again, right, like that's one incident, that's one thing, right? Like, you know, I can't, like, I think probably at least once a week, um, at least once a week, I'll definitely say, uh, you know, prior to, um, uh, prior to COVID, right? Like once a week, you know, my, um, my family, not my family, but my wife, she would have a story of some wild shit that some dude said, right? You know, now I can't be with her all the time, right? You know, because she has her own life, her own her own work, her own things that she does, and I have mine. But like, you know, what does, what would it look like if she had a system of support, you know, so that way, even if I'm not there, right, like something can uh something can be addressed, right? Like, you know, like what does a, um a community safety team look like? You know, in the same way that we have cop watch, right, you know, and folks who I think systemically watch police, right, like can there be a, a, a community watch that's not interested in over criminalizing folks, but is interested in, you know, like making sure that we do have community safety. Um, I sat on a panel with, um, with Melina Abdullah, um, who is the chapter lead for Black Lives Matter Los Angeles, and she gave this beautiful example of you know what black folks in the community would do um when the kids were on their way to school you know a bunch of the older black folks a bunch of the older black women right um in the community would just sit outside you know they'll be talking to each other from across the street you know hey girl what's up right like you know sharing recipes and all that and whatnot right but they were sitting outside to protect the kids because the kids with the Audubon Middle School um, right off of Crenshaw, you know? So, but um, what Melina was talking about was like community safety looked and felt very different because, um, you know, because there was a broader community effort, right? So what would it look like for us to organize those efforts, for us to be strategic about them? You know, so that way, right, like, you know, as soon as, like, as soon as somebody, 
like is saying something that's wild, right? Like, you know, we could be like, hey, 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 hey cut all that shit out, <laughs> you know? Um, or as soon as somebody is uncomfortable, you know, they'll have a number that they could immediately call, right? And folks will be there, you know, in a minute or less. Um, I think like, you know, the more we think strategically about, um, about building that infrastructure, and again, like this doesn't always have to be something that's facilitated through a nonprofit. I think this stuff can be done, right? Like literally in living rooms and people's homes, right? Like when we talk, start talking about building community safety, we can, we can do the work, I think, to help keep our community safe. Um, but again, that's going to come with a concentrated effort right that um that really centers you know what people need to be safe and i think to johnny's point earlier you know right like that 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 decenters patriarchy right um and those that uphold patriarchy um so i'll stop there and i see there are a couple of questions in the chat I think Mark is still uh, muted. Uh, the first question is for you, David. I'll just read it. Um, uh, what general device do you have for creating accountability among other black boys and men without pathologizing them, i.e. rendering them disposable or toxic behavior? Thank you, Johnny. Um, that's a great question. Um, I think the first thing Right, like, uh, well, first off, you know, I think one of the things that, that needs to happen um, is that this needs to be men's work, right? Like, this needs to be the work of other black men. This needs to be the work of other men in general, right? Like, this labor should not fall exclusively on, um, on women of color, queer folks, um, people who um people who don't identify as men right like this should be the work of men right um and with that right like there needs to be a deep relationship building um because it is i'll tell you right now right like you know oftentimes when people talk about transformative justice or restorative justice you know i think tahita mentioned it earlier it's not you can't restore something that wasn't there right you can't transform something that wasn't there, right? Like, so when we're talking about like cultivating relationships, the first piece to, um, to creating accountability, right, among black boys and men is having a relationship with them, right? Um, you know, it's a lot easier to, to check somebody when you know them by name. Um, I would say definitely starting there. I think second, you know, um, what it looks like to, um, to, have that conversation on creating accountability without pathologizing them, I think is getting to know them and getting to know them deeply, right? You know, um, I had one student who, um, who was deeply homophobic, right? And, you know, it, I had to figure out why, right? Like he was, he was deeply homophobic and he had two very, um, two experiences that happened to him and harmed him, right? You know, on one account, you know, he was assaulted while he was incarcerated, sexually assaulted. And on another account, um, his mother left his abusive father for a woman and didn't communicate with him for a year while he was incarcerated, right? So that left him with some deep resentment um, that he never unpacked, right? So, you know, I had to do like a lot, a lot of emotional labor. I didn't, I wasn't necessarily prepared for, right? But really having to help him unpack, right? Like what it means to, you know, understand that that, while that experience is unique to you, right? Like we don't get to blame, you know, that entire group of people um, for a couple of experiences, right? Like, and also too, like having to facilitate, right? The healing part, but um, like with his family, like helping him check in with, you know, his mom, like, you know, having to like talk to him about his dad and like those issues. So um, again, like that, it's not easy. It's not even close to easy. Right. But um, now he, he wouldn't say or do half the problematic things when I first met him. 
um, because, right, like, I think we were able to build that relationship, right? And after getting to know him and getting to know the root of the issue, then we were able to start unpacking the behaviors and then changing the behaviors, right? But that's not going to that's not gonna happen um, if you don't know the folks. And also, too, I think for my, um, for my queer and trans fam and for my femme fam, they don't have time to wait and they don't have time to be patient, right? You know, because they're literally dying, right? You know, they're literally being harmed out here in these streets. So, um, so for us, right, we have to be um, both, uh, we had to be both patient um, with our brothers, but also impatient, I think, in helping to address the situation. Because again, right, like we want our communities, we want our, our sisters, our queer trans fam to be safe. So I think, you know, to make a long answer short, um, relationship building is absolutely key. Um, addressing trauma, right, and getting to the root causes of behaviors. And then three, um, starting to do some of the unlearning work after you get to the root causes of those behaviors. Yeah, David. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, David. Johnny, can I yeah. turn to you for the last question? Yeah, I just wanted to, if, if I can, add a number four to uh, to David's list, because uh, I, I, you know, I, I think sometimes when we're talking about dismantling patriarchy, you know, we really focus on the the breaking things down or like the dismantling or the destroying of these things, right? But as we're doing that, we also have to be building up those other parts. So like yeah. what are the things that that young man is really good at? Uh, what is it something that this young man really loves? Or what is, you know, one thing that we used to do, um, I don't, we, uh, we used to do it at BSS, for the Sunset Coalition, is um, when a young man gets up to speak, everyone like cheers for that young man. Like no matter what, you know, just finding those other things to like build up their confidence, to build up their, their um, the strength in, in them believing in who they are um, and reminding them that they are they are they are valuable to us and we um, you know we can't just focus on dismantling we got to also build them up yes yes all of that hell yeah yes Johnny last question what gives you hope in being able to you know combat patriarchy and and you know break the cycle of violence what gives you hope gives me I think so I've been uh, running this young men's program for uh, seven, eight years, and I, I think it's uh, seeing the, the change in the young men at the end of the program, uh, I think is always like, reminds me about um, what, why this work is so important. Um, and I'm just reflecting on like hearing these young men who are in high school break down like patriarchy, being able to explain it so eloquently and like put into practice what they learned. Um, in particular, I think for me, um, the program that, that just wrapped up for the year at KGA um, was pretty well divided between straight cis men and queer trans men. So it was like evenly divided. And to be able to see that kind of space on a weekly basis was like, was like uh, really invigorating for me. It really made me feel hopeful. Like uh, all of this work that I've been doing over the years is like, you know, slowly starting to come to fruition and I think that's the yeah seeing the development of the young man at the end is always um, what pushes me to do more. I appreciate that and uh, unfortunately we're out of time uh, we'll have to close and I just want to ask all the uh, participants to, to uh, tap in to the chat or to uh, snap fingers or wave uh, spirit fingers and, and jazz hands and all of that for our panelists uh, David Turner with the Brothers Sun Selves Coalition and Johnny Rodriguez with Kamai Girls in Action. Um, it's so important to have these spaces um, where we're talking about uh, issues uh, across uh, the gender spectrum and how to combat patriarchy and in, in, in gender-based violence. Um, I think it's important that these spaces are, are mixed and that we also uh, provide room to have conversations about uh, what people can do along the spectrum. Uh, really appreciate um, the CAT 911 team and Youth Justice Coalition for organizing this space and providing the opportunity to lift this work up. Uh, thank you again to all of you who were able to join us uh, for your participation and for your eagerness to address these issues in the world.
Thank you, everybody. Um, maybe I want to hand it over to um, Kim to close it out. Or does anybody else from the Cat 911 team want to say any last words before we close out? Hey folks, this is Paul. Thank you for joining. Um, thank you for your patience and sitting through with us. Um, and go ahead and unmute everybody just so folks can say thanks or whatever as we close. Thank you all. I feel like I had a bit last night at all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. But also, I think there's some like covering this area. You have a lamp, like a desk lamp. <laughs> All right, folks, I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. See y'all soon.